Welcome back, everybody. It's 614 Headsets time, season two, the new beginning. Uh, excited to have you on. We got a great guest today. Everybody go and say hello to everybody today. What's up, everyone? Good to be back. Good to be back. Season two, get rolling. Mm -hmm. What's up, everybody? Joining us today is going to be Coach Schroeder from Granville. We can't wait to have him on and talk about his great run he's had. Hey, Tom Brady said it best. Football is unconditional love. We're three high school coaches that just can't get enough of football. It's a lifestyle for us. As we get into season two, we just want to thank everybody that's helped make season one successful. All of you that have been with us since the beginning, like even last night, Coach Taylor from Newark came over. He was at my house for about three hours and just talked offense. It's been pretty cool seeing all the connections from this. Uh, but as we get going, we want to tell you guys, make sure you subscribe. The big thing we're trying to do here in year two is try to grow even more and reach more people, have more communities and programs on. Help us out. Subscribe. Follow the show. You know, another big news for us is our clinic. January 27th, we're going to have our own coaches clinic by coaches for coaches. No culture talks, right, Ryan? Not, no, no culture not, talks. Nitty gritty. Get into the X's and O's. Not 20 <laughs> minutes talking about your culture. All right, we're excited. And we think we have a pretty fire venue locked down. All right, we're going to go tour it after Christmas. And I think it's going to be something everybody likes. It's going to be a good location if it can fit us. The last thing is, hey, congrats to all the players assigned today. It was awesome hopping on and seeing mm -hmm. all the graphics and seeing where kids are going. And I, I mentioned it to our kids. Congrats on your crowning achievement to all your hard work, dedication, and sacrifice over the years. So congrats to all those young men who are out there making that early commitment today. Without further ado, Donovan, tell us what we're going to get into as we get going on this episode one of season two. We have classic segment with our pick six segment, always up first. And then we're really going to get into, if you guys remember from our very first episode of season one, very first episode of the of the of this kind of series of lessons learned from championships, we're getting back to that mantra of like the recipe that it takes or like the key ingredients that it takes to win a championship, to build a championship caliber program or team. So that'll be the main talking points for it today. And, and we're really excited to go head first into season two. Hey, before we get started, hey, 614 Headsets is brought to you by Fundraising University. Fundraising University of Ohio offers a variety of fundraising <laughs> efforts that helps football teams run profitable, effective, and fast-paced fundraisers designed to raise the most money in the shortest amount of time to reach their fundraising goals. Fundraising University Ohio is locally owned, operated, and with their six-step blitz system will help your team maximize profits. As a current coach himself, Brent Maxwell with Fundraising University will sit down and help you pick, plan, strategize, and execute your fundraiser that will allow you as a coach to focus on your practice time, prep time, player development, and personal time. If you're interested in Brent running a fundraiser for you, you can contact him at bmaxwell at fundraising, the letter u.net or 740-501-8946. So all you coaches out there who are getting ready to plan your offseason, hit my man up. I know Coach Sayers already is planning on it. All right, you'll find nobody better to dominate your fundraising with. All right. All right, Ryan, tell the people about this wonderful man we have on today. I'm excited for this dude. I, we've been able to uh, connect through one of the coaches that I first ever had on staff. And I met Wes one day. He came out to our practice just to check it out my first year. And he was probably like, oh, my gosh, what, this, is crazy. Yeah. this is terrible. But <clears throat> he's done a phenomenal job. I feel like ever since I've known him, all he does is literally win. His record overall is 52 and 15. And he's 38 and 8 at Granville. I feel like he sent me the longest list I've ever seen of coaches awards, which is amazing. <laughs> it's long. Yeah. No, it's That's great. Not it's awesome i wish i had that many too so he's 20 bear with me here 2023 20, 2022 2021 licking uh county league coach of the year 2021 central district coach of the year 2021 division three coach of the year in the state then in 2019 uh, when he was at lima he was at he had northwest conference coach of the year the lima news dream team coach of the year northwest district coach of the year or he was at Allen East, and that's 14 – what was that, 14 and 7 there too? Yeah. yeah. That's a long list of coaches. Yeah, I, I, it, to, to be clear, I didn't send you the list. I, no. you, you asked. I, I didn't ask more. I, did, I sent my resume, and I said, hey, yes. you, you want off that, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, and it's great. I, it, it's, it's a phenomenal a, resume. Hey, who better 
to have on for a recipe for championship episode. Mm-hmm. I can't wait. In fact, we play a, a coach. We played you in a seven on seven. It was a great competition oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. there at the sales. I think you beat us. I think that was uh, you guys won and woke our kids up that day. And, and I was impressed with a lot as I saw. So I've watched from afar. It's the first time I've ever really got to talk to you and I, I'm excited for it. Coach, go ahead and, and just talk a little bit about your run. What's brought you to Granville? Uh, what do you got going on? What are you excited about? Yeah, so I started at Lipsick, my alma mater, small town, up by Finley. Went to Lima Senior, got my first teaching job, went there, and then was down at Old TNG Liberty for a few years and got my first head coaching job at Allen East, like Coach Sayers said, did that. And then uh, from there, I moved back down here and got the Granville job. So that's where I've been for the past four years, four seasons. So. Yeah, I've been, I moved around a little bit, but it's been a lot of fun. Moved in and saw different levels and different styles of football. So it's, it's been pretty cool. Love that. Pick six time. It is time for pick six. All let's right. round ro- Hey, let's round Robin at this time. So okay. it's not just two, two, two. Let's round Robin. All right. Uh, I'll start off with mine. First one. This was, this came to my head. I like to do like a football one and then a random one. So I'll start with a football one you. first. All right, I got you. Should Florida State have made the college football playoff? That's a great debate. Oh, man. I, I think Alabama is a better team, so I, I don't know. I, I, I think they're more deserving, but I don't know if, if, if they're going by. If they had the in the rules where it said, hey, if a player injury can hinder a team, then it's in the rules, and Alabama is better. So. I think if you really ask yourself, like, okay, yeah, Florida State, maybe they deserve it. But if you really are honest with yourself about if you're a football fan, you cannot, you can't even argue that Florida State's a top 10 <laughs> without that quarterback. You can't make that. Nobody can make that debate. And it, who was it on the, sh- I don't know if you guys watched the playoff show that Sunday or whatever. One of those guys was just going, it, it was his hell bent to defend Florida State. And I'm like, he doesn't even believe this. Like, there's no possible way he believes this. As an Ohio State guy, we want Michigan to lose. And you yeah. know, I think Alabama gives us a better shot there. So. I tend to agree with that. So I might have missed it. What was the – is it the four best teams or is it – Most be the like, four best. Yeah, so that's – I don't know. But then if you do that, like Ohio State might still be in the mix. But Georgia's probably still in the mix. Georgia's Jeremy, still in the mix. Yeah. Yeah. Georgia's in there. If you got four best teams yeah. – I know. That's the slippery slope there. That's why I don't know. I don't think – I think for me it's principle. They were undefeated. They yeah. need I get it. I see both sides of the argument. Yeah. Well, you, Ryan. I just don't think there's an argument for the other side because now you just take in what's been like natural. Like if you win on every game and you don't get to go to the championship or the playoffs to go as to- a big school from a power conference. Yeah. No matter what, your quarterback gets injured. I don't care what happens. That's why you coach and that's why it's next man up. That's what we like to believe, right? I get it. I get it. I'm not it's for me, I'm, it's, I'm it's, it's very those. interesting. I know I've had injuries after injuries and won some games that we at the Beechcroft game this year. I didn't have my quarterback, and we we could have just said, "Okay, we're not playing." You know what I mean, and be done. And we won our regional championship. Our quarterback tore his ACL in the first playoff game. We won that with our backup. So it was. I get it. I get the. Yeah, so you can't even do it, are you? You you lost the quarterback, went to the regional championship. (laughs) But we were winning. Like Florida State was. I don't know. They weren't playing well when he was. They were playing close with a five and seven Florida team. If they if they blew him out like Ohio State did with Cardell, then it's okay. Then yep. they should be in. But they struggled. They about lost that game. Thank yep. God we don't have to do this any longer. Right? Yeah. yeah, we'll finally yeah. get what the people deserve. Just wait. Now it's going to be the the thirteen team mm-hmm. that doesn't get yeah. it. Still doing. better though. Still better than what it was. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. Sayers, are you up or stout? Are we bouncing this off to you? I'll go ahead and go up next. I got next. Uh, What's the number one for you activity that you and your family do for Christmas time since we're right around Christmas time now? The generic answer is hang out with family. We don't really do anything too exciting. We do the elf on the shelf for the girls, but we just we have it set up where we spend time with her family, just our family, and then my family. So nothing our kids are too young to be traveling, so Really Coach, let me ask you a serious question. You talked about go. Elf on oh, the Shelf. And I, had, <laughs> the Grinch. I went on a little rant the other day. Our, there's two types of people in this world. There's the people who Elf on the Shelf and it's within their family. And then there's people who Elf on the Shelf and post it every day for the whole world to see. Are you a post it every day? We, we do not post. My wife loves it. So I, I and my girls get so excited. So I think them get excited. But 
Mm-hmm. No, we don't post it. But I do see those posts, and then we'll get ideas, and I'll send her an idea. Say, hey, I got an idea. You know. And, and here's my That's hot. It's, it's, it's here's my hot take. We do it. My daughter loves it. <laughs> You just don't have to post all 24, 25 days. Just post yeah. a couple of them. And Ryan, on the other hand, every day it's his elf on the shelf. It's, ooh, what did Coco do? do? You know, the good thing is, though, his name, the, our elf, his name is Buddy. He's a savage. And here's the thing. I posted, what, like four or five? You can't even name. I haven't posted every day. You chilled yes, down once too. I took my hot take. We had some great ones. But I really stepped the end, in the batter's box and really ruffled a few feathers. But you know what? I was surprised. There's a lot of people on my side that are like, enough people. We don't need every day of your elf on the shelf. I feel like you're just a Scrooge, though. Like, nope. You're we do always, it. We do you're it. always grumpy about everything, though. There's never a time Stout's just like, overall happy. I saw a great. You guys, they could be, hey, look, no joke. They can be 12 and 0, 12 and 1, whatever they want to be. And then Stout's so just so mad all the time. I saw a great post on Twitter, and maybe when I have kids one day, I'll do this. They did, like, the Elf on the Shelf for like, a couple of weeks or whatever, and then they left, like, just, like, completely clean, like, chicken wing bones in yes, the shape yes. of an elf and was, like, a little note that said, like, Santa, thanks you for, like, your gift to him, like, Merry Christmas, and freaked the kids out. I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to do that whenever I got a couple of kids. I saw that in my belt. <laughs> All right. I actually was – my first question is a Christmas one too, Ryan. I'm not a Grinch. We're in the spirit oh, together, baby. Mm. All right. What is the best or worst Christmas gift any of us have ever received? Bonus points if it's worse. Mm-hmm. I'll let you think. I'll go ahead and tell you my best and my worst, okay? There's the nine-year-old me whose Christmas is capped. It was the best Christmas. I, I, I capped too early in the Christmas game is when the N64 came out. And the the family coordinated it out, and you got the N64 from here. You got NBA Jam from here. You got an extra control. Best Christmas ever. Nothing's ever lived up to it. Worst Christmas gift? Don't buy me clothes. I'm picky when it comes (laughs) to clothes. Somebody one time bought me one of them, like, silky JC Penny, and it had dragons and fire on it. Oh, my God. It was the tackiest thing I've ever saw. And I know you're not supposed to talk like that, but you know what? I'll be the heel today on Christmas. I'll be the Grinch. It's fun to talk about. Those are my best and worst. I would say my 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 best is very similar. Is we got Madden '94 for the Super Nintendo, and we played. I just remember that it was a, it was a pretty big deal. I, I played Madden. All, I'm a Madden guy from from when it first came out. I love that game, but I remember vividly being a kid playing there. So there you go. There you go. What about your worst though, Wes? I don't know. That's what I was trying to think. I don't really think. Uh, it's hard to think of a worst. I, I think my mom tried to get me like a Ohio State thing. It was like a tank top, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not. Yeah. Going. So it was like, hey, look, it was like a short cut off tank top. Like, like, why? Don't try. It's not gonna work. <laughs> I feel like it's always closed. It's always the worst. Like it is. And I, I sit back like, and think about it. I have a couple that are closed, and I feel like for me, my best though is you guys are definitely way old getting whatever you just said in yeah. n64 and the 1994 madden I was born in 95 which oh were you yeah yeah see I, I remember playing 90 madden 94 that's crazy see so for it's me 1994 it's called 94 but go ahead <laughs> see <laughs> it's too old for me but my my best christmas uh gift was the playstation one that's what me and my brother got on one of the Christmases. And then it was also mixed with it, too. We got we got Madden with it. And then we had got MLB. And we used to, we sat down there. We played, we probably played the whole entire day all the way into the next day. But, like, we did take a break because it also snowed that Christmas and we got snowboards. I, that Christmas was just the best Christmas ever, for sure. But then for me... My worst was, it was like my senior year and my dad had just, he had just got a new girlfriend or whatever. And so she's trying to buy like gifts or whatever. So she buys me and my brother and he would agree definitely with this. We, she buys us like a leather jacket, like a black Mm -hmm. leather jacket that has, I don't know, like things on the end, like a little cuff right here. And it just looks unreal. I was like, I'm not, I would never wear that. I'm wearing my letterman jacket every day. And so that was definitely the worst. I remember getting into my like in the car with my brother and be like, I will never wear that. I hope dad got the receipt. Dude, you're such a hard I'm surprised you still don't wear it to this day. No, no I could never wear the leather jacket. <laughs> I can't pull that. I can't pull that. Though. I will say though, I've been thinking of one of my best gifts though. I was a big jersey guy and I got 
Glenn Big Dog Robinson from the Milwaukee Bucks jersey at one Christmas, and I was so pumped. I hey, was, 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 <laughs> let's hear Donovan's. Donovan probably got gifted a house. Coach, you don't no. know this, but Donovan lives one of the best lives. If I get reincarnated, I'm gonna come back as a white. Now, Go ahead, Donovan. Donovan. Yeah. Hey, you want to talk? Donovan's honestly been the most privileged person in the coaching world in the world of playing. He's just I'm playing, but coaching. Yeah, I've been pretty lucky the first two years. First two years, it's been fun. War, I'll, I'll give you my worst gift. And it wasn't, you got to hear me out on this because like, you're going to be like, why is it the worst gift? But it, there's, a, there's a point to it. My uncle gave this to my brother and I uh, Christmas morning. It was either Christmas Eve, like after like, Christmas Eve church services or like Christmas morning, something like that, like afternoon, something like that after a church service. And he gave us Nerf guns and they were like the open face ones where it's just like the bullets are sticking right there. Like, there's no plastic or anything in front of them. So my brother and I, took the caps off and we put thumbtacks in the Nerf bullets and we were, Oh yeah. And we were like eight and like four at the time, I would guess maybe like seven and three or something like that. And we were chasing each other around, shooting them with each other, shooting each other with them. And that eventually one thing led to another got my finger caught in that door and cut right off. So it was a whole long train of events that led to that, that if you look back, that was the worst Christmas present. So it sounds like a good Christmas. Sounds good until the... Sounds good until the very end. It was real fun until the very end. We go like around with just dark sticking fault. in our arm. Huh? I feel like it's your own fault, though. It was definitely my own fault, yeah. More so sure don't blame the Christmas gift. That's not... I gotta blame the gift. <laughs> Wouldn't have happened without the gift. Experience. Let's hear the best. 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 Yeah. Best would have been... I think we were still in a condo when my, just me and my mom and dad, they got me a... Buzz Lightyear tent from like the old like 90s like animated Buzz Lightyear show like the space capsule and I I remember as like three year old being obsessed with that thing so much to the point that when I moved out they tried to throw it away and it's now sitting in my garage because I'm like that thing's not going anywhere so I got a Buzz Lightyear tent sitting in my garage right now next like, to my car I just got my son a Buzz Lightyear do jitsu it's the new thing nice it's fire he my, loves Buzz my daughter's getting into the. Uh, she asked Santa for a Woody. She wants Woody nice. and the dinosaur. So that's what Santa's bringing. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Something about the Toy Story, man. All right, Donovan. Next one. All right. What's better, a cold drink on a scorching hot day, or a warm drink on like a bitter cold day? Like you just came in from shoveling snow. Cold drink, no doubt about it. I'm not a big hot drink yeah. guy. I don't drink coffee in the mornings. I I drink ice. I have ice water in here. I drink ice water all day. I'm a cold drink guy anytime. But. That's me. That's a fact. Me too. I'm a cold drink guy too because I don't like coffee. Coffee doesn't do it for me. I'm going to drink a Celsius every morning, <laughs> Lonnie, something like that. I'm not drinking no hot coffee at all. I'm a coffee drinker, and I'll still say the more satisfying would be the, the cold drink on a hot day. I'll go cold. I was curious. I heard that at work the other day that people were talking about like how good hot cocoa was and how they like it better than like a cold beer or something. And I'm like, I don't know about that one. Let me bring that up. So that was you got a bunch one. of construction dudes saying they'd rather have some hot cocoa than a cold beer. Dude, when you're walking around out there the past few weeks for eight hours a day, yeah, they want some hot cocoa instead of a cold drink. Hey, they want some hot cocoa instead of a cold I don't drink. know. I think you're working with some soft construction workers. Yeah, there ain't no, yeah. there ain't no grit on that squad. No wonder they're taking so long in all the projects. Good yeah. Lord. Oh, dude, uh, let me get some hot cocoa, please, before I go hit the nails. Mm. No, that's not. They, Bring them some coffee when it's 15 degrees out there. They enjoy it. It hasn't even been 15 it. degrees yet, dude. It didn't get <laughs> cold till this week. Dude, I'm telling you, a couple weeks ago, it was like 26 is the high. There's a wind where oh, we're at. It's a wind tunnel. It's bad. Dude, Ryan, anyway. Ryan, yeah. save this guy, please. Yeah, I'm yeah. Good. But let me, this, both of mine are Christmas. I love Christmas time right now. They, I usually haven't liked Christmas in the past. Like, I've always been called a Scrooge and a Grinch. But this year has been great because my son's about to be three next month. You know what I mean? He's like believing in everything. He's like all about every single thing we do with Christmas. He loves driving through the lights. My, I got to know, what's the number one Christmas cookie for you guys, though? We did this a couple episodes no, ago. No, movie. This one. No. Good lord. <laughs> My fault. Wait, I just met movie. movie. Say monster cookie, but I, yeah, the Christmas. No, no movie. Because I was thinking of the movie. Why did I have to say My Elf. Fault. No, you cannot or, go yet, Donnie. It's our yeah, guest. West always goes first, bad. Donnie. I had to get it. Out. <laughs> Someone's gonna say it. What are you guys gonna say? It? I had to get it the out. Guest always I'll goes see. first. I might have Who is away. this guy? Go. No, for I respect it. I was gonna say Elf, because I'm debating, but. It's probably Christmas vacation. It was L for Christmas yeah. vacation. We always had that wow. debate 
and I'm a big Christmas vacation guy, but not a fan. Oh, Elf's, Elf's great too, so I'm good with either. Good, Donnie, go ahead now. Actually, I take back Elf. I don't even remember what it was called, but it's like the old animatronics one from the 50s, 60s. You're talking about like old Rudolph ones and That's stuff? Rudolph? <laughs> that was like the first Christmas movie I remember seeing, and that was always my favorite. We'd always watch it on VCR. Like when I was young. So that, that's probably my favorite. How long has it been since you watched your favorite Christmas? A long time. A long time. They're, they're, still, on, Am- they're on like Amazon and Freeform, dude. Yeah, they, they don't are. have to have a VCR anymore. No, maybe I'll go back and buy it or rent it for this Christmas. All right. I'm going to have to go with either Christmas Vacation, but just to throw another one out there, more on the new side. I'm a big fan of the four Christmases. I, I'm I'm a big fan of of that one. As there's a new school one, mine got to be Home Alone. That has mm. to be my favorite for sure. Sticky Underrated bandits. Home Home Alone is definitely my favorite Christmas movie, and I would have thought Elf was, but then I watched Home Alone again this past week in class. That's what we watched, <laughs> and so for me, I was like, dang, I'm definitely I'm back to the one in this movie. To be my favorite. And I've watched it twice now. So. We stick to the content standards, Ryan. Great job. No, that is with ours. All right. So I'm going to break the Christmas spell. Almost. It actually fits into your favorite here, Donnie. Mm-hmm. But I've talked about on this show many times my belief in Bigfoot. All right. But it's winter. So I have to ask, Coach, do you think Yetis are real? And if so, where do you think they live? I'm not a conspiracy theory guy, so I'm out on that. I'm out on that. Yes, not a Yeti believer. Yeah. See? Good, Wes. I like that. I'm with you on this. I hate when he brings this question up because we've already had this question. Just Dude, like we said. Winter, Christmas, Yeti. Mm-hmm. Yeti fits with his favorite movie from Rudolph. There was a mm-hmm. Yeti in it. I'm telling you, Yeti's really is probably somewhere in the mountains of Peru somewhere. That's what I'm saying. Mountains of Peru. Mm-hmm. I like the conversation, but I'm yeah. not, not a... Any of the conspiracy theories, you can miss me with that. I just don't like like the, I don't know. Wes just likes coaching offense, man. Yeah. Yeah. Is that. the Yeti real? What do you think? Maybe. I think it was. I don't think it is anymore. It's extinct. Ooh, at one time, there was a uh-huh. Yeti. I like yep. that. I could definitely get behind that. I can't get with that. See? Yep. Look how everything changed. That's great. <laughs> great question. Let's get going in here. Let's talk Let's talk to this man. About what with he the, really with, does. With, the, with the two page list of coaches of the year awards. Let's get into it. All right. So when we started out with what are we going to do in season two, our first episode, we want to do a throwback to what we did to start the whole show off. And that was lessons learned from championship seasons. This year, we're going to talk about the recipe for championships. And all of us are going to talk about over the years, the ingredients that were there that helped us compete or win championships. And we're not going to be rude here, Donovan. And it's time now that we're going to let our guest of honor today talk about it, considering he probably has more than all of us and could have picked a better guest to go through this. But coach, You've been winning them back to back. What are some of the things that ha- have been on in your program or on your teams that have you found won championships? I think that I think there's a lot. I know Ryan doesn't want to talk about culture, but I think that's a pretty big piece. You can't culture's relate. okay on here. We're not at clinics. But it's not okay right. here. Okay, okay, good. Talk, talk about what it really does take. We're good with that right here. People just want to hear about you, but. Yeah, at the clinic, you're not hearing that from us. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I get it. I get it. Everybody, every, I think it's – obviously, it starts with good players. You have to have good players in comparison to what you're playing against. But I, I think, uh, like, the the relationships you form and, like, being able to hold dudes accountable and being authentic and being yourself and, and coaching kids hard and then them taking that, that difficult coaching to heart and, and responding and then that just bleeding over. Because I was talking to a friend of mine about this not too long ago, and he is like, you don't realize when it happens, but it just happens where that culture just shifts – to like belief in what you're doing and, and confidence in, in what you're selling. And it, it, it just, it's like just constantly doing the same thing over and the kids all buying into it and then them holding each other accountable. And then it just like feeds throughout the program. So I, I, that's the biggest thing for me is like just the belief from the kids, the organic interactions. We like, we keep track of like organic high fives is what we call them. It's like just dudes, teams that a big play just happens and they're celebrating by themselves. They walk off and nobody's dapping them up. And then you see teams that one of their dudes makes a good play and they're 
their face, picking them up. And I just think that's stuck. Cause then the next guy wants to be that, make that play. And then the next guy, and then it just like snowballs. And I think that, that genuine care for each other is. It's funny you say that. And it brings me back to coach Jeff Castle. He was our offensive coordinator for a year or two at AU. And he brought that out and he rolled that out to us and he called it meaningful touches. Yeah. And yeah, he, yeah, he, yeah. He looked up like all this statistics on championship teams and the meaningful yeah. touches and then us being a bunch of smart asses. What do you think we did at camp that day? <laughs> we ran around like slap hands, meaningful touches, <laughs> like just slapping hands like that. But it is true. And it's actually really funny. Like I actually had a, a college coach one time ask me, like, what's your real opinion about player X? I'm not going to name him on here. And I gave him my opinion. And he said, yeah, we knew something was wrong because when we watched this film, we noticed nobody celebrated with him and he didn't celebrate with anybody. And that was the big that was the reason they didn't offer him. Yeah, I I that makes perfect sense. I think, yeah, I think that's, uh, and I tell our guys too, I'm like, if you don't want to celebrate, if you're not happy for us, don't do it. Like, I don't want, I don't want anything fake around us. I know everything's got to be real. And then kids will do it. They'll buy in or they'll find their way out of the program. But I, I, that's funny that I'm, I'm, if I was a college coach and I was recruiting guys, there's no doubt I'd look at their interaction with their teammates because that tells you how they're going to interact with the guys they're going to be around. I think that's actually really, really interesting. When you, in an ideal world, you got a program, you got a culture that like, no matter who's there, like, that kind of attitude and that kind of spirit rolls into year by year. But every now and then, I'm sure we've all seen it, whether we played or whether we coached, like you have like a group of guys that graduate or you have a group of guys maybe that stop playing football and like that the people that lead that charge are gone yeah. and like you're missing something. And so in your experience, like when that spark needs reignited, does that have to be like a player thing to reignite that spark? Or does it have to start from coaches of like, I'm going to pour some gasoline on here and give them all the matches. And then I'm never going to light this. They have to figure out how to light it themselves. Yeah, no, I think that it's, it's true every year. I think every team goes through it this year more than any, because we only had nine seniors and we were wondering who was going to step up and who was going to fill these roles. Cause we had last year, we had twins on our team that were on our team from sophomores and they just always brought energy to practice. And, and I, I, I think it's interesting you say, I, I don't think, I think a coach can foster those conversations and put those environments together. Like you said, put the gasoline out there. Like fire. You have to, look, I think the kids got to be the one to, I think you got to help put those, put them in situations where they can make them feel comfortable and safe at practice where they can be themselves and have fun and but still get after it. But yeah, that's, yeah, I think that I think the coaches have to foster it, but they just got to be like, they got to guide it and let the kids form the culture yeah, thing. Change kids. Yeah. You unmuted yet, Sayers? Because you were talking. Yeah, yeah we that? all I saw that, Ryan. We're just waiting for you to jump <laughs> in, brother. No, you guys are good. I, <clears throat> I was muted for a second, but I was just saying that I agree with what you guys were saying previously. I was going to say, for us, we just say, like, party at the football, right? Make sure you have a party at the football after every play, like, no matter what. Figure guys up, too, and protect them. But for you, though, how do you, right, you guys don't have necessarily the biggest of teams, right, all the time and, and stuff. And, and I know we had talked during the year or whatever, or after the season, you had a lot of injuries heading into the last game of the season, right? Like, how are you able to get your guys that are, are – young guys and stuff ready to play in those big games they're ready to play in like uh, the, the second rounds of the playoffs the third round of the playoffs and stuff and step up like what is the key for you to get those guys that are next man up guys ready yeah i think that when a buddy of mine coached at avon the last couple of years they've had quite a bit of success and i just pick his brain like, what do you guys do or what's because he coached with me when i was at allen east and i'm like what do you guys do and he's like hey, any chance we can because they're not going to hurt us for a series even some of those jv guys we'll throw them out there for a drive here and there, just get them some live reps when you're maybe up 14, 21, and they're not going to kill you in a situation. And then you can coach them off that. And you just kill them that way. And then I just, just the belief in them, talking to them, talking to them at practice, talking to them on Saturdays and just constantly coaching them up. So it's all, that's that it was, it was a challenge. We were putting guys out there and we won't put guys out there that we don't think are bought into our team and what we're trying to do. If, if they're not, they just won't, I just, you just won't fly. So it's, we had guys playing both ways a lot. And so it's trust. I use that word a lot with our kids. At least I do on our yeah. side of the ball. Kids want to talk and it's just, Hey, you might be the, you might be a really good athlete or a Friday night athlete, but the trust might not be there. Trust might not be there from the culture side. 
might not be there from an assignment side. I might not be able to trust it. You're going to do what you need to do. Like, sure, you're a great running back, but if you can't fill and pick up a block or, and you're not willing to, like, we can't play you in, 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 in certain, certain situations. And so, I think trust is a big thing. And that's what we say. And Brian, you brought up a point. Like my first ingredient I talked about is adaptability. You talk about we've all had injuries and things come up and even year to year adaptability, right? Like one year, your team might have a different identity and you have to change it to match your personnel the next year. And so I said, just find ways to win with where your personnel is, whether it's year to year, or even week to week. Like if you look at our season, we hit a stretch where we had to adapt some and we had to change and lean on our running game more than our passing game at times. And you know, we even had to adapt within the year with our, our practices. We start out doing things one way. And we start to see like we got to adapt to keep it fresh or we got to adapt to do some more walkthroughs and things. And so I think really championship teams adapt year to year and they adapt well within a season with what's going on. I agree 100 percent. Fact. I think that was like one of the ones I wanted to put, but I saw you put that in the script. And I was like, that's, that's a fact. You And that's why high school football coaching is so unique because we're not out recruiting guys, handpicking guys for our offense and what we think we can get done. You have to adjust to what you have coming up, right? And some years you don't lose that many players. Some years you're going to lose 15 seniors, which is detrimental at times. But then it's also like now you get these young guys up and get them rolling. But that that's just one thing I always like wonder about is like how do some teams – maybe I could be better in getting those young guys ready. You know what I mean? That's Those are things that I think I always question is like how do some guys – because we do have some guys that are ready, but – then we throw some guys in and they just don't look like they've ever been coached before. And it's mm. just like, okay, that's not forget even everything. You know what I mean? It's not even what we do. Like we have never coached you to do that. And so it's like, those are the things that I think it is. That's what keeps me up at night. I feel like in this coaching thing. Sure. Yeah. I think uh, so you said it and I don't know if, I don't know if this plays fully into it, but like kids that sometimes don't look like they're ever ready. And, and maybe it's the prep like during the season, maybe it's the prep in the off season, but whatever it is, it's like about that prep. One of the things I put in it, it ties into it is how you have to have a group of kids or at least majority or a loud portion of them that love the program and the game, because all that plays into the prep that you were talking about, like to make them ready for the game itself and for practice. I firm, I, I'm a pretty big believer that if you have a group of kids that love the community that they're from, love the or i don't even love the community they're from if they want to play for the community that they're from if they want to play for the school if they love the program or even the coaches there that can mask a lot of things it, it can be an extra gear because they want to they don't just want to win they don't just want to prep to win they want to prep to to prove their community right or to make their community and their school and their program or their coaches, whatever that may be proud. So loving the program, or if you don't love the program, whatever, if you love the game itself, a lot of that can mask some of the, if you're shorter than the average team. If you weigh less, you're not, whatever that may be. So that's one of the things that I had written down recipes. For sure. That's for you. Talk to you, we said that same thing. We talk about loving the game, loving your teammates and loving to compete. But yeah, that's, we talk about that a lot too. I Coach, I got it. thing is you right. love your teammate and love all those people. And then, that goes into one of my points is what is huge for us. I think at Northland, like <coughs> in the past two years to win last year, tie for the city of North. And then this year have such a successful team season is like accountability as well is huge because this last year was the first time I started seeing the kids taking it over, right? Like run on and off the field. Like your helmet's always buckled, like really bought into holding each other accountable. Like, oh, why weren't you at workout or, or don't skip workouts? You know what I mean? You need to be there. You need to be here calling each other, making sure guys were at practice and all summer, not just mm. sometimes, but they were always working. And, and it took our kids to hold them accountable. And then also I feel like something that I started to do during the years, like holding the position coaches accountable, because if I'm going to hold your group of kids accountable, and shout out to my, I know he's going to listen to this, my receiver uh, coach fails because I gave him up downs with the kid ones. Like both of them did up downs. Right. No. Okay. His helmet's off and unbuckled. And he's talking to you. Like every day, our thing is you don't unbuckle your helmet or take it off until you're out water, until you're like there standing on at the water. And so that's been, always been my expectation, always been my rule. No questions asked. And the kid had his helmet off and was just standing there talking to the coach. So 
then at that race, okay, the coach didn't hold them accountable. So how am I going to just up down the kid for that? So they just both did 10 up downs. Okay. Uh, you made your assistant say, coach do up down. downs because this player took his helmet off? I already told them that's what it was before we went out there. Jesus, Joseph Stalin over here. I already yeah. like, yeah. like, yeah. like, yeah. told the world? that's what it was. Man, you would catch me on the bad day and it would be on. <laughs> Like, I already it, did before. Well, I know we well, ain't. We're gonna open up that story right now. That's for exactly. that's for later in the season. At the end of the day, I I told them before we went out there, like, we ain't playing right. I'm hope if your guys' group is talking, messing around, if they don't have their helmets buckled, because it was a time that we were in this part of a season where we could just get you can get lost, right? You're playing teams. We were playing guys that weren't we had seen right. The Centennial, the, then we played Weststone, and then we played Mifflin all three in a row. That not saying that they're not good, but like they weren't up to our tier last year to where we knew we were just a better team overall. We had 60 kids, they didn't, they would have 23. So it was tough sometimes when we played those three games in a row after beating East, bit like a big game, like we had to hold our kids accountable and our coaches, like to still get the best out of everybody, even when you have like easier games. I got a question and this is something coach you're in a a position where I guess your teams have been winning championships consistently now for more than just, Hey, we win it. And then we don't for a couple of years. You're what we would say at the top of the mountain. Right. And how do you keep your players hungry for that next championship when you've been up there for so long? And that might be hard to answer, but just from our personal experience, Two years ago, it was chasing that championship that our community had in 21 years. And our kids were hungry. It was a belief. You could feel it. It was determined. Like You could feel it on them in a Friday night every time. That's what they're out there to do. And then last year, it was almost like that group had used to won a championship. They didn't seem as hungry day in and day out or on a Friday night. And so I don't know if you maybe have a strategy or some ideas on maybe how you've done that or, or things you've seen. Yeah, I know. I, yeah, I, it's, it's, you're definitely, I, I felt that too when our, our final four run, cause we never went to a regional championship before. And then we went to that one and won it. And I felt like our kids were, they weren't satisfied cause they were, we were trying to win it all like everybody, but it felt like a weight would maybe have been lifted off our shoulder. The next year we lost 21 seniors. So that next group had to prove themselves cause they were only, we only had like four or five guys. So they're like, Hey, we can prove that we can win too. And then this last year is the same thing. And I, I thought about that going into next year. We have so many back. We're, we played the underdog role so much. Like we all week, we just keep saying they don't respect us. And they don't think, we don't, they don't think we're here to stay and blah, 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 whatever. But, and I, I think about that a lot with this upcoming year is we have a lot of expectations. And I, I don't know. Hey, there's, it's going to be an, uh, interesting to see how our kids respond to that, that expectation where everybody's like, on our schedule on paper, you look at it, we should go 10 and 0 again. Now they're not going to say should, but we should have a good shot at it. And how are they going to handle that? Everybody's they're, they're coming right for you. And I it's think a, that might bring it, that might bring them hopefully a little sense of urgency to practice. It's a different vibe. And that's what we told yeah. our kids. Coach Payne said it best. And one day he put a great, he said, you are always used to being the hunter and now you're the hunted. Yeah. And that was like a very profound way to put it to our kids about you were hungry and you were chasing it, but now everybody's chasing you off of what you've done. It's, it'll be interesting because we're all in the same situation. Ryan, you're on your second, we're on our second. Coach, you're third, fourth, fifth, seventh, tenth. I don't know okay. where we're at now, but it, it, it's interesting. <laughs> I think um, that's like a huge thing to think about because like for us, we're in a unique situation where we – our kids were hungry, right? That was my first four-year class where we had a ton of, we had a bunch of seniors. I had really talented guys last year. I think I was telling Wes this like the other day when we were texting her today or something. We won last year a lot off of skill. Like a lot of it was winning off of skill and who we had out there. And those kids were great kids. And now we lose those guys that we've had for four years. I've had Amir Brown carrying the ball for me for four years. And I lose Kevin that's been my linebacker for four years. I lose Ryan Neal, my lineman. I lose all these guys that have been with me for four years and actually played as freshmen or, or played as sophomores. And so now this year, we still have a really good senior like class coming through that are, were juniors last year and played just like didn't has as, as significant roles as our other guys because they were just seniors in front of them and they're just a little bit better than them. But our kids love to work hard and this group's like hungry to show. Okay, now everybody's all oh, Northland lost everybody. They're gonna 
they're just not going to be that good this year. I, I, we've heard it from a bunch of people already, like students even in the building and stuff like, oh, you guys lose a lot of guys. So it's going to be a struggle next year, but our kids are hungry for that. And I think that's going to good shift for us now as people saying, oh, you're not even going to be good next year. I think part of that too, and I think you see it a lot with teams that have consistently won or contended for championships is like that unwavering attitude. Right? That's one of the things I had written down. But like, even if you have teams or kids that like have been on the outside looking in, right? they've been on those teams and maybe they didn't play or maybe they were a freshman and so they weren't really a part of the team. They were part of the program, but they weren't a part of the <laughs> teams. There's something where that mentality, that attitude is instilled in them to not flinch, right? And even if they themselves have not done it, whether and they're a part of a program that has done it in the past or they've been around people that did do it in the past, there's something about that not flinching. Best example I can think of is like 2014 Ohio State, right? Ohio State in 2014 is still a great program, a historic, even at the time, modern day, great program, but they hadn't won a championship in, what was that, over a decade? None of those players knew about that, right? So there's no memory necessarily of winning a national championship, but there was something about that team going and playing Alabama or going and playing a Big Ten championship or Oregon, whatever whatever it was of those three games where they didn't flinch like when something bad happened, right? There was something that kept that attitude and that team together. And it was that ability to just stay steady throughout the whole process, even though none of them had experienced what that needed to be because they'd never been in those moments before. They'd never been in a national championship. None of those kids had. had. Sure. I, I also got a, another question though, for you, Wes, is like X's and O's wise. What have you seen your championship teams be able to do X's and O's wise to be able to put themselves in position to be successful year in and year out? Like what are things that you see? Like for me and I stout, I'm a, I saw you already have wrote this down, but that was going to be one thing I talked about is that's what we were able to do this year is explosive plays, right? That, that, Mm -hmm. change the ball game for my offense this year just having huge plays be able to be hit and, and it just gets your team rolling and, and gets you going so for there's just an example right there is for me yeah like I, i'm curious about is there something you preach program wide like ryan talks about it like we have our whole mountain image and, and on the mountain are six steps and they're the six steps that we think if we do these things we're going to win and get to that top of the mountain and three are some culture things and then the three things we we preach in our program is explosive plays, win the rushing battle, and win the turnover margin. And, and last year, we found out all these statistics. It worked. <laughs> we finally rolled this out. We won a championship. It worked. So there's a, a big belief in it. And it's really interesting to see all of our conversations and our how we try to play are geared on those three things. And honestly, in the last two years, the only games we lost is when we've lost something in that category. When we've won those categories, or even we could maybe even, for example, not win all three, but most of them. And it's pretty crazy. Teams that win the turnover margin win 78% of their games by this one thing we found. And if you could rush for just one more yard than your opponent, you have a 75% chance of winning the game, or you're, you're going to win 75% of your game. So it's really crazy, the statistics behind it. Those are our big three. Is there something maybe in your offense or your team that you guys really focus on? I, I think early in my career, I was just like, I had such a stranglehold and wanted to do everything myself. It's like, hey, this, we got to win. We got to win. I put so much stress on winning. And I was trying to run special teams and defense and offense and water breaks and weight room and everything. And then as I've gotten to Granville, I guess I got some really good assistance. And it's from year one to year four, I think I've evolved from the standpoint of, let my coaches do the work and having them come up with ideas. And, and I have guys that I trust because if I tell them, Hey, we're not going to do that. They're okay. But I think that was, that's the biggest thing for my, of us to grow because we've had different quarterbacks each year. We've had running quarterbacks. We've had statues. We've had, you know, we've had uh, both. And so it's, it's interesting, but I think from uh, what we want to do is like, we, I tell our, our defense, I'm like, if we hold them to three touchdowns or less, it's our job to scheme up three or more. And that's pretty much it. And then before the season, the culture wise, I allow, I give them a list of a sheet of just different character traits. And I said, you guys decide, you guys talk, come back to me next week. What are the three things we have to do in order for us to become who we want to be? And they change from year to year. I want the kids to have, I want them to have the ownership of that, 
but typically it's the things you want. It's selfless teammates. It's competitive spirit, all that stuff. So like we, I allow them to, you, you got, and then if they're not showing me that, if I see a kid not competing for a ball during one-on-ones, I'm like, you told me for us to be who we want to be, we got to compete. We have competed at all times. You're not competing. That, that you're not competing to the best of your ability. And then I can, I can't say I'm being unfair or whatever. It's I'm like, you guys told, if we want to be there, that's what we got to do. So it's, I think it's a culmination of a lot of things for me. That's where we, I, I love that because we did, we, that was to this year was my first year really buying into it with my seniors. Like this was my group that wanted it. Like they wanted yeah. to be at football. They wanted to be around. So we really bought into like doing meetings or, and talking about what we needed to be the best. And so we put up five words right up on the board that they chose and, and they picked for us to be able to win and be successful and be yeah. champions when they came up with that. And that, I similar, same thing. And then ours is huge. The big thing that, for us, is I say it all week, every week. I call our defense, so it's just like they don't score, they don't win. I truly, firmly believe that. And I think for us, one thing that I put on there was just complimentary football by offense mm-hmm. and defense. Because for us this year, it was like our first year, right, that we had an offense that kind of could drive down the field, right, and keep our defense off the field and not and us not be playing defense all night and having to get defensive scores and different things to win games or get – big turnovers and onside kicks, but we were able to put like compliment each other out there on the field and play together with our offense and defense. You know what I mean? It made each other look good out there, which I think is a huge key. Yeah, for sure. That's complimentary football. I mean, that's what we've got into the, our kicking game that we were talking about before we started is a huge change the way you know, game change. Play, the chain, play, play behind the chains, make them drive the field. And it's just a, it's, a, it's an advantage mm-hmm. at high school level for sure. I love it. I, there's some good stuff in there. And say, hey, Coach, I want to appreciate you coming on. I, I've always heard about you. That your name's come up a lot. I've seen you. I'm really excited. I got the opportunity to talk to you. And I, I even just wrote down just that three character traits. I like that mm-hmm. as we think about maybe changing up our things that have maybe become a little stale after two years. And uh, we know you're going to do great things. We're excited to keep watching you. And uh, those are a lot of good ingredients. I think anybody that's listening, if you're a coach right now, if you you try to focus on some of those things and you turn that into your offseason goal or how you're going to build next year, I think you're going to have a great chance at competing for a championship or elevating to get to there. You might not be ready to win a championship right now. I think we've all been there before, right? But it's about trying to keep elevating along the way to hopefully get to that point. Ryan, let's go ahead and wrap this thing up, baby. Now, we appreciate everybody listening on, man. Season two, big start tonight, being able to have Wes on here. And just, we appreciate him, man. He's done a great job over there at Granville. It's just, like, fun to watch. And also, I love going over there. And that's how my final seven on seven each year and be able to go over there and compete. And uh, he usually beats us up, but we don't talk about that. He, we, we, we send our kids over to run the hill, though. We love using that. Yeah, it's beautiful, but no, we appreciate everybody. Make sure you subscribe though, right, Stout? They got we got to get our subscribers up and get ready for this year. We also sent out a newsletter too. Stout created a nice little fancy newsletter for everybody as well, so that you can see what we're doing all year. Yep, we're gonna um, try to maybe do some this month on six one four headsets. We're gonna actually try to get into some content stuff too, some X's and O's, some favorite plays we've seen over the bowl games and things, and put that out to you guys. So make sure you get an email or you see the link, subscribe. We're going to try to put out some good stuff and keep growing what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Don, Donnie Mack uh, finally got a week off work. We're going to be able to see, sit down and then uh, do some things in person this week. Next week. Yeah. So good time. We appreciate you guys, though. And shout out to uh, Brent at Fundraising University. Make sure you guys contact him and get everything set for the year. I know I'll be contacting him soon to set up our, our event with him. And uh, he does just such a good job, though. No doubt. Hey, Merry Christmas, everybody. Have a great holiday. Thanks for having me on, guys. Take care. Appreciate it.